Lori, you're L-I-C-S-W. Welcome to Shrink Wrap Radio. Thank you very much for having me. I'm really happy to be here with you today. Yes, well, I'm glad to have you here too. You came strongly recommended uh, by someone who's done a lot of bioenergetic work and training with you, Dan Gross, who I've not met in person, but uh, he's given me, you're the second person he's recommended to me. And uh, so he's got a good batting average so far. <laughs> so I'm very open to that. So um, we're here to talk about your, uh, your practice in bioenergetics. And um, I was exposed to bioenergetics, I think, through one of my master's students back when I was a young faculty member at Sonoma State University. And, uh, and I think in some workshops that I took, we got also with other people, there were sort of pieces that were brought in. But uh, I'm not sure how many people who are listening and viewing us today are going to be familiar with bioenergetics. So maybe you can kind of give us your introduction and to the sort of history and overview. Sure. So as a beginning, let me say that bioenergetics includes work with both the body and the mind in psychotherapy. And in our experience as bioenergetic practitioners, we need to work with both in order to really address the roots of the problems that people come to us to solve. Okay. So that's a that's kind of an overview. Of, yeah, it's, not it's an a, important important one to know because uh, a lot of people are from you know the idea of mind body uh, is much more widely accepted than it was uh, many years ago. So so keep going. Absolutely, and some of the. Um, practices these days are like a specific technique for working with the body, something like EMDR is a technique. In bioenergetics, we offer a variety of tools and to address what's happening with the person, both mind in terms of, we call it's called bioenergetic analysis, technically. Mm. So we bring in that analytic part of wanting to know a person's history and background and what has brought them to the point in their life that they're coming to us and they're presenting problem. Uh, but we also work with their body directly and we have different tools that we bring in based on what's happening for the person and what, what they need in the moment, which might change moment to moment to moment for a person. So it's actually a very intuitive process and intuitive work. When you say uh, tools, mm -hmm. I assume you don't mean pieces of hardware. Uh, <laughs> what, are, what are you talking about? Um, so actually, I use the a metaphor of imagine if you had a, a sumac tree growing in your lawn or around here we have locust trees that land in our lawn, the, yeah. the uh, seeds land in our lawn, and it makes that sends up a sprout and then the roots go down. So Think of if we cut off the top of that, what happens? It, uh, the it roots must... are still there. Yes. And, and uh, typically they, they send up more shoots elsewhere exactly. in the yard. <laughs> exactly, exactly, right. Yeah. And it takes time and it takes, you know, you might need a, a big shovel and you might need a a uh, hoe when you sometimes in the around it you might need to rake some to clear out the, the soils so you can really since some of you need a really good digging tool to get down to the bottom of those roots some of those right. trees have really deep roots and so it's not quick it's not easy some sometimes but by getting really using those tools to get to the roots of the issue we can have the sumac tree not growing there anymore and enjoy our beautiful lawn right well, or our garden or whatever yeah well i'm still so, wanting to get a more of a picture of the tools are you talking are you use, doing a manipulation with your hands or is, is there some kind of uh, deep bodily pressure or or so, what so the tools begin with body awareness and uh -huh. we could do this now we could invite our listeners or people who are watching to do this as well. 
So it starts with noticing what are you aware of in your body at this moment? And I use the tool of body awareness. Over, we'll come back to that in, in a minute, but let me just give you an overview about that tool. I use it almost every session, not every session with my clients. Sometimes people need to just talk about what's happening with them. But body awareness to me is like home base because our mind can tell us stories about what's happening to us and can make up things about Definitely. what's going on. Our body offers us empirical data. So for example, um, you, we could say, what are you aware of in your body at this moment? If you're, if you're game to- Yeah, well, I'm aware of uh, my breathing and kind of in my chest area, and that feels good and fine. And my, uh, my hands are resting on my thighs and uh, that feels comfortable. Great, great. And so I invite our listeners also to pay attention. What are you aware of in your body at this moment? And for some people, some of my clients, they might not really know how to answer that at first. But, uh, and so I'll help them, I'll say, okay, what are you aware of in your breathing? Like you just said, you notice your breathing in your chest. And are you aware of any areas of tension in your body? And is there any, how's your level of hunger or thirst in this moment? And sometimes if somebody has like a constriction in their throat, their hand will go there when I ask them that mm -hmm. question. And that becomes a pathway in. So I'll say, okay, leave your hand there in your throat and just notice what do you feel there? What do you, as you bring your attention there, what are you aware of happening in your throat? And maybe they'll say, oh, it feels a little tight and feels like something's held back there. And so I'll say, okay, and I'll give them a, a paradoxical intervention often. I'll say, if something's tight, usually you don't want it to be tight, but I'll say, okay, how about if you make it a little tighter and we just, we get some information from it. We say, okay, is it, as it comes a little tighter, does it have a message for you? Or is there another image or a thought or something that happened in the rest of your body? And sometimes that takes us down a, a, a path right there. Right. Like, yeah, so like somebody might say, oh yes, well actually I, there's communication with my brother that I haven't been able to express. And the tension here is that the place where I'm holding back on expressing that. I say, okay, uh, let's, you're willing to explore some what that communication is. And then let's see what happens with that. So that takes us into a journey. Sometimes there will be like, I had a client once who had quite a lot of tension in her back. And as she brought her awareness there, she had a memory come up of something that had happened with her father. Mm -hmm. And that tension had been there in her back for quite a while. And so as we worked with the memory and then she needed to do some expression to, there was something that she wanted to say to her that had happened with her father that was upsetting. And so then we went off and explored that and the, the tension released. So it's yeah, I was trying to remember that I know I've got some experience that I had and uh, all I can, I, I thought there might be more specificity, but this is, I'm reaching way back in the past and I don't remember this incident, but, but I do seem to recall that, uh, that so, so sometime in the past uh, being massaged and tears came in and I don't, remember that we worked with it particularly but clearly there was a some sadness that was being triggered in my body yes yes yeah. exactly and so working with the body itself takes us to a whole other level than you know you probably didn't go into the massage therapist saying i think i have some tears held here somewhere yeah it's it's out of our awareness 
but our body holds tension, often that, that tension is holding back that expression or that energy. And it can even go back to have roots in early childhood experience where an emotion or an expression was not acceptable course, in, the, yes. in the environment. Yeah. And so as that emotion arises in our body, we actually get tense to hold against its expression because we've learned that emotion is not safe. And of course, there are times and places to express different emotions, but if we're holding them back all the time, that's gonna inhibit our vitality, our well-being, our capacity to enjoy our life. Right. So, right. I'm wondering about the uh, the history of the approach. And I'm wondering, does it go, does it perhaps go all the way back to uh, Wilhelm Reich? It does. It does, it does. yeah. Yes. He was the, the one in Freud's circle who began to really focus on the body and gave us the concept of body armor. That's right. Yes, and actually, Alexander Lowen was a student and a client of Wilhelm Reich's. And Alexander Lowen went and got his medical degree. And he and a man named John Periakos yeah. believed that Reich's methods, Reich practiced like a typical analyst did in those days where you had people lay down on a couch uh -huh. and free associate. And they felt that Reich's methods of just laying down wasn't enough to get to the, the issues that people were dealing with in their bodies. So they developed a set of these tools, I, I will call them, to work with people with their bodies to help get to some of those tensions and release that armoring. I, I remember in the, uh, in the workshops that I was in, in the early 70s, uh, where, uh, and I'm not sure that they were explicitly about uh, bioenergetics, but they were bringing in some of the ideas and techniques. And the thing I remember are certain stress postures. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm not in a place right now where, where I could demonstrate that, but, um, you know, standing in a way that, as I recall, with your knees bent, and then kind of coming up to just a place where you would get some shaking in your body. Yes, yes, exactly. That's a basic grounding technique, which is another tool, another one of the tools. Uh huh. And Alexander Lowen is said to have gotten people off the couch and onto their feet. And it's a metaphor for also, if you think of the couch, the laying down as a regressed position for people, okay. you know, more yeah. of a vulnerable and getting onto your feet has to do with being in your life, being solidly rooted. Mm -hmm. And back to the, the tree metaphor, <laughs> um, I like nature metaphors. <laughs> um, if we imagine a tree being its roots go down into the earth and it draws up energy and nutrients from the earth and the roots help it stay, stay solid against the winds, the storms of life. So literally the more rooted we can be in our bodies, in our feet, in our legs, the more we can flow with the storms of life. And we all know that there are lots of storms that happen in our lives. Yeah, right now. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yes. So grounding is a tool that I use, again, second to body awareness every day, certainly with my clients. I, I check in with them like a normal talking therapist would about what's happening in their, in their lives and what they want me to know about. And then frequently, not every session, but frequently, I will say, how about you stand up and I will have them either have them put their feet about hip width apart with their legs going for feet going forward and either just slowly bending and slowly straightening like you did at that the workshop or I'll have them bend forward and on my website I have a, a 
brief article about this with a picture of the, the bend forward exercise where you let your head go also and you let your arms hang. Uh -huh. And again, part of that exercise is to really put your focus on your feet and your legs instead of up in your head. And so much of us are up, up in our heads that doesn't really serve us. So, and then when we bend and straighten our legs in that position, oftentimes if we don't have too much tension in our legs, uh, some shaking will go through or vibration. And that vibration can feel pleasurable just in and of itself, can it's like the, the vibration of life moving through our body. Yeah, <laughs> I, I can remember that part of it. And also, I'm not sure if you're aware of this. So Lowen, did you work directly with Lowen or was he already passed on or? No, I had the good fortune to have some, I, actually it might help to give a little bit of my background also. Yeah, yeah. I, when I was in college, I was depressed and I had gone to a psychotherapist and um, Kathleen Hendricks, who is married to Gay Hendricks, they've written the bestseller Conscious Loving, lived right near us okay. and where I went to college in Colorado Springs. And Kathleen is a dance movement therapist as well as a transpersonal psychologist. And so I would go to her office and she had a big living room and I would uh, do exercises, dance movement exercises, which was the the seed for me of that working with my body was really going to help me in my addressing my depression. And then I moved from Colorado to Los Angeles and then I moved to Boston. And people had told me I needed to be more confident and I was looking for a body-based therapist yeah. and just happened into a workshop about bioenergetics and we did that grounding exercise yes first thing and i said this is for me this is what i need <laughs> wow so i got into therapy with a bioenergetic therapist and was in therapy with her for many years and then went to social work school and did the bioenergetic training program and that's the the getting into bioenergetics at that point in my life has been one of the great blessings of my life so yeah, that's wonder, uh, wonderful to get that background and interesting that it can go on as long as it needs to, I guess, like, like psychoanalysis, that it's not necessarily going to be a one shot thing that you no. would do in a workshop. And now you know it, that really, right. yeah. I no, think there were there were a lot of people during the period of of the early seventies where people would do a workshop and then sort of start offering their services to the world. Right. Yeah. No. This is not a this is not a do a workshop and then then you've got it. Yeah. It, clearly, you you've you've devoted your life to to this, and but going back to that time, there was the. East Coast version of bioenergetics through Alexander Lowen, there was a, a man by the name of Stanley Kellerman, yes. who was the West Coast, and I interviewed Stanley actually uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, he's oh, also wonderful. passed away recently, mm -hmm. but um, and and I'm not sure what all the distinctions and differences were, but uh, do you know anything about that? I do, but you know what? I just realized I didn't answer the rest of your question about meeting Lowen. So let me go back there. Okay, yeah. Good. <laughs> um, I Lowen lived in Connecticut, which is just about a three-hour drive from where I live. So I did have the good fortune to go to his house, to his home office a few times and have sessions with him there, uh -huh. which was an amazing experience. He was a very alive and very committed to his work, loved, passionate, loved his work. Mm -hmm. And I also went to some workshops that he led at a, a Y camp in Pauley, New York, and got the chance to, he would lead workshops by uh, doing sessions with people that we would observe and ask questions. Yeah. And 
yes. So I'll always remember that he would, he said at one of those workshops, people need to cry and you need to cry deeply. And having a white man, an older white man, tell me I needed to cry kind of, kind of, uh, <laughs> <laughs> blew my circuits a bit, you know, uh -huh. and, and that's, that has really stayed with me, though, his, his passion for his work, his, his vitality, he lived well into his 90s, and did these bioenergetic, energetic exercises for himself regularly, and I use the exercises regularly for yeah. myself, it's, it's kind of like flossing your teeth that you, you do <laughs> every day, you know, to, Get the get the kinks out. You you mentioned that on your website there are uh, what uh, pictures or videos of these ex exercises. Yes, yes, I have a. Go ahead. Let's go ahead and put your website out now. I, I'll ask you probably again towards the end. Give sure. people another chance to take out their pen and paper. But uh, what is how do people find your website? My website is www.laurieur.com. It's L-A-U-R-I-E-U-R-E.com. And I have, I've written lots of articles. I have a video there that people can watch about the bioenergetic approach to depression and anxiety. And they can sign up for my email list. And I send okay, out good. emails with some, not too much frequency, but some frequency about podcasts I'm on and articles I've written and so on. Yeah, excellent, excellent. So what about Stan Kellerman? Did you ever get any exposure or hear about uh, this uh, renegade guy on the West Coast? <laughs> I, don't I did not get any exposure to him directly. I do have his books. And okay. I certainly have heard of him and know a little bit about his work. Yeah, yes. I yeah. Uh, I was when I interviewed him, and, and uh, I think there was a book involved. I was surprised to see how deeply theoretical he was, at least at the, that point of, in time. But I had students who who worked with him and who had this same sort of experience that you're describing, and they became kind of disciples of him. Yes. Yeah. yeah I know his work is brilliant. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah, so one of the things I'm, I'm wondering about is um, there are so many mind-body therapies or somatic therapy is a word now that in the, in the therapeutic community is pretty widely used and accepted. And so some of the things that you're talking about are reminding me of other approaches where I think they probably say very similar things. Mm. So can you comment on that? What, what are similarities or differences or points of distinction uh, between your work and some of the other things that are out there, like sensory awareness, I think, mm -hmm. and, and, uh, uh, and various others, you know, and a lot of work uh, real, around trauma is Yes, bringing a lot of attention to the body. Yes. So there are a couple of things. Uh, one is in terms of the trauma work in bioenergetics has always been focused around trauma, even if we didn't use that word. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways that bioenergetics is focused around trauma specifically is that we have the, the theory, the belief, the notion that a person's body actually forms in response to the early childhood environment and that a trained bioenergetic therapist then can know something about a person's early history by looking at their body and yeah. looking at the shape of their body right and what our experience is about that is that this may be out of a person's awareness but it becomes the lens through which they see their whole life. And it's not, there are different types of trauma. You know, there's acute trauma, there's an experience that's traumatic. And part of what we identify is what we call chronic relational trauma, 
-hmm. So it's not that the parent gets angry at the child once, you know, that happens to everybody, but that the parent is always angry at the child. And that is a traumatic environment for a child to grow up in. I have a, a client who was terribly, terribly abused by a, a adoptive parents. And one of the most significant traumas about that is her parents were always angry at her. And she has said to me, hundred, literally probably hundreds of times, because I've worked with her over a course of a number of years, are you angry at me? And oh, yeah. if she does something like, you know, things that people do, you, you spill a glass of water accidentally, or you bring in some sand from the beach or, you know, whatever. Oh no, were you angry at me? Are you angry at me? And healing those kinds of early, deep, traumatic relational experiences can take a lot of time and a lot of repetition, especially when they are that deeply ingrained in a person. And these are often out of a person's awareness. They don't come in saying, um, I, in fact, oftentimes people, it, it comes up during the course of the therapy or something in their life happens that activates a memory of that trauma. And they may not even be able to identify what it was. And so we, work with that as it's in their in their body experience. And because I can read their body, it gives me a clue to that early experience that is coloring their whole life. Well, when um, you think back to your initial uh, meeting with her, um, how would you describe her body? Did you see, did you see that in her posture, you saw evidence of this history? Oh, absolutely. Yes. Yes. She is very, in fact, she walked up to my door and said, am I supposed to be here? <laughs> you know, yeah. people don't come to your door and say, am I supposed to be here? Um, and I think with somebody that traumatized, any, any therapist certainly should be able to recognize some level of an extremely traumatized person. I, maybe lay people can't recognize that, but um, she's very thin and very meek, exceedingly meek. Um, and that's an ongoing problem for her in her life and an ongoing challenge in the therapy um, to work on because yeah. if she protested anything that her parents did, they would hurt her worse. So speaking up for herself is extremely frightening and terrifying. And, you know, obviously that's one of the things we all need to be able to do in our lives is assert ourselves. Did the look of her body change over uh, the years with the during the course of the work or, or are those postures so deeply buried that they just are fixed for good? Uh, um, for her, again, because of the level of the trauma is so extreme, the fact that she's even alive right now is a major, major, uh, prog major progress, I guess if you could call it progress. Um, so just her being alive and having some enjoyment in her life mm. is, is really the work. I have other clients that are not as traumatized as that, um, but where, for example, I have a client whose mother really didn't want to have children and father was quite neglectful as well and left the house suddenly when she was a teenager without saying goodbye. And in, you can see it in her body also. She's quite quite thin. Her skin is quite drawn uh, and quite pale. And she has a, a, a chest that's concave like that. Yes. Um, and with her, one of the challenges, and actually this, I'm going to bring it around to another tool that I use. Is that okay? Yeah. Um, is... I work a lot with people around personal boundaries because that's one of the ways that people get 
traumatized in their early relationships is when they're not allowed to have boundaries or their boundaries get violated mm -hmm. and all the ways that that happens for children. And uh, so she ha has that history of boundaries being violated and she allows people in her life to treat her badly. And she, she lives in a, in a pretty nice neighborhood and her neighbors actually are mean to her. And she, and I think part of it is kind of the way she presents to the world that people think they can get away with treating her badly. You know, it's, a, it's an interesting dynamic that happens. And so I've worked with her on, so don't slink back if, you're, if you see a neighbor who's treated you badly, come forward in your chest and say, I have, I have a right to be here. I own this house. I have a right to have a good life. I have a right to be treated well by people. And it's actually started to really change the dynamics in her relationships around her. Wow. And with her, an interesting thing is she was chronically back to the muscle tension and armoring issue. She was had chronic constipation for years and went to the, the doctors and Oh, bless you. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. It's, a, it's sort of an off and on chronic cough. Uh, um, went to the doctors and they couldn't really help her with the constipation, you know, told her to take Metamucil and those kinds of things. Miralax didn't really help. But what we learned is what I learned with her is she didn't feed herself well. She didn't really didn't really believe she had a right to, even to eat well. Mm. And so I worked with her on you need protein every day. You need to have something warm in the winter. And so now she's started making herself a soup every day, and oh. she's not as constipated. Wow. <laughs> and she's. And some of her, and she has some kind of anorexic tendencies, some kind of body dysmorphia. And that has started to sh shift as well. She said, look, I gained a few pounds. And yeah. she's feeling better. And I, we start to see the change in her body. Again, it's not, it's not dramatic with her, but it's a little bit. And her body she starts to come forward a little bit more. Breathing's a little better. She looks a little more well taken care of and so we see those kinds of changes over time it is it feel almost feels like there's a bit of reparenting going on what does that apply absolutely uh -huh. absolutely yes yeah, yeah so she gets a better parenting experience with you than she had <laughs> with yes yeah, yeah with she the says others. i can i can go to sleep at night because i know you care about me you know uh -huh. Yeah. 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 yeah just, just, go ahead. Yeah. So you're very far away from the quotes blank screen uh, stereotype and, uh, and very willing to be involved. Uh, which raises the question a couple of questions. What about the tr traditional uh, therapeutic uh, issues of? Uh, transference, counter-transference, resistance. Can you speak to those and how they come up in your work? Absolutely. As a bioenergetic therapist, one of the things that we work with is the counter-transference in our body. And what happens when I'm sitting with a person is a body resonance. And that becomes part of the information for me about what what direction to go with a client or how to help them and sorting so, out go ahead so you're listening to your own body and getting cues from uh uh feeling like, okay what's going on in me probably has something to do with what's, go what's going on with this client exactly yeah and then sorting out through grounding in myself what's mine and what's theirs yeah and you know, in terms of transference, counter-transference issues. And I have to be very clear on my own limits and boundaries as I invite my clients to be clear on their limits and boundaries. And also I'm practicing for them, I'm practicing helping them reach out for what they need as one 
can want as well. Yeah. And resistance, we don't love the term resistance in bioenergetics because we sort of think of whatever is happening for the person is what's happening and, and what needs to be addressed. We certainly do notice, and uh, we actually had a conference a few years back that we titled Two Steps Forward, One Step Back, The Journey of Vitality. So we certainly notice that it's not a forward motion journey all the time. Yeah, it's, yeah. People go in, in circles sometimes or might make some forward progress and then and then need to step back a little bit and integrate that. And that that's part of the process. That's part of the work. That, that's part of how a body changes and grows is a little forward, taking some risks, trying something different, and then integrating that. And yeah. So uh, you're uh, very accepting of of who they are and what they bring rather than trying to get right into reshaping them. You know, okay, this body is needs to be more, I'm gonna lay you down on the table and stretch you and push and change your fascia and no. No, no, that's, that's not the way of work. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it's actually sort of one of the ways bioenergetics has changed, I think. Alexander Lowen was much more in there, uh, getting people working and with their bodies and opening up their breathing and releasing the tensions. And I think uh, over the years, we've become more focused on the relationship and the importance of the healing relationship as part of what helps people to change. And if you think about it as uh, that, if some, somebody has a coat on and you want them to get there, take that coat off, the sun, the warmth of the sun is a better, uh, better tool to use than the wind trying to blow the coat off, <laughs> right? I so, think that's an Aesop's fable, isn't it? <laughs> right? Something, <laughs> something like that. that. <laughs> Sounds familiar. <laughs> so yeah. we want to be come with lots of love and respect and and yeah. understanding of who this person is and what their journey has been and that helps them to to release those tensions now of course there's a time to give them a nudge and and say i, I think you really should do this or uh mm -hmm. you know of course that's part of it yeah yeah as i hear you speak I, and you know and i speak to so many therapists in this format and it it feels like there's a lot of commonality uh with people who may uh, have a different kind of training initially but you know the importance of the relationship and uh that seems to be kind of a, a common thing that's come into a lot of these approaches and uh, backing off from trying to uh change people through some veiled sort of attack approach right yes 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 and and recognizing the the so-called resistance as uh them doing what they need to do in terms of their per, their perception of their life and that per, particular circumstance and time what they need to do to survive and uh, to do the best they can Yes, so that said, there certainly are times when I will say to a client, um, one, of, one of the other tools that we use is helping open up a person's breathing. And, mm. and what I mean there is the unconscious breathing patterns. And our view is that when a child has been shut down, and, and again, if you tell a child, repeatedly not just once but repeatedly don't be angry don't cry or don't have so much energy the way they shut that down is through muscle tension that restricts their breathing and so nobody comes into therapy saying my i have muscle tension and my breathing is constricted um, because my mother told me that 
girls don't get angry, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, but I may have that in the back of my mind that this person has constricted breathing from muscle tension because they weren't allowed to get angry. Now, opening back up that anger with them or opening up the breathing um, and we use to open up the breathing, we use a ball, an exercise ball. I have people go backwards over that. And um, I have tools to help people work out their anger strongly and directly so that they're not afraid of it. And so they can use it on their own behalf for, to protect themselves and people and the planet, the beings that they love. So in that process, somebody may throw up to me, oh, I'm afraid to do this, or oh, my anger is really bad. And I may say to them, how about, I may, again, it's the nudge, how about you just try it and see what happens? Yeah. And so I'm not going to let them stay with, no, I don't want to do that, unless it's a real clear, if it's a real clear boundary, of course, I would respect that. Right. But there are times I'm going to give them a gentle nudge to say, how about if you try it and see what happens? Sure. Because that is where resistance can come up. It's a fear. It's a fear of change, a fear of doing something different. And usually when we go, when we do that gently, then something opens up for them and some, they feel better. Some energy is released. Yeah. And their breathing opens unconsciously and those tensions aren't there constricting them as much and they are more able to enjoy their life and have vitality feel feel better physically mentally and emotionally on your website uh, i saw that you do workshops uh, and uh, sometimes internationally and i'm wondering uh, if if bioenergetics is uh, has a larger following in other parts of the world than the U.S.? Yes, it has quite a large following in Brazil, for example. Where, wow. Yes. I, I would not have thought Brazil. I was, I was thinking Germany. I was, think, uh, I was thinking European, but I, yeah, that's interesting. Well, Brazil, Argentina, Chile, Peru, the South Americans are more in their bodies to begin with. Yeah, yeah. You know? And we have international, wonderful international conferences. And when, I, when I've been to an international conference in Brazil, the music starts playing and everybody's up dancing immediately. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> they don't hang back, you know. Yeah, right. You hear people hang back a little bit, yes. and, you know. Yeah. They are, they are so in their bodies that it's, I think it's an easier, easier leap for them to, to do this work. Mm -hmm. And also in Europe, um, Italy, the, the Italians are quite open to bioenergetic work as well. Uh, and Poland, certainly Germany, yeah, Spain, France. Yeah. yeah. We even have training groups right now in Russia and China, which is very exciting. Yeah, I think the Chinese, uh, uh, <clears throat> not the government, but... <laughs> individual Chinese people and clumps of Chinese people are really hungry for uh, for these kinds of approaches, for more uh, humanistic approaches, which are in such contrast to the dominant paradigm there. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I wonder if there's anything I'm not asking you that you are planning to say <laughs> or wanting to get across yes um i think that i so oh, let me talk a little bit more about the boundaries and a way that that differs in bioenergetics from some uh, boundaries is a big topic now okay yeah good and uh i could act, i can show you some of the ways that i work with that with people because it is huge with people in their relationships and nearly everybody who I start working with, it comes up at one point or another. And sometimes I've learned that boundary issues actually underlie anxiety and depression in people. 
And they don't even necessarily say that to start off with, but it, it become, becomes clear in the course of the work. And what I have people do is I generally invite them to stand and do a grounding exercise. And again, in bioenergetics, I know grounding is used a lot these days, but we it's a specific exercise of working with your feet and legs and working to release the tensions in your feet and legs actually, and helps to develop stability and structure. And then I have them put their hands out like this and add some words like no or stop or this is my space. And I notice what happens in their body when they do that. And frequently what will happen with people is their words may say one thing and they say no or stop and their body goes like this. <laughs> and because so much of our communication is nonverbal, if somebody is saying stop and their body goes like this, it's actually a confusing message to the right. recipient. Yeah, a mixed communication, I, yeah. Exactly, exactly. Further, their voice may not express conviction. They may not have learned to use yeah. their voice, yeah. right? So they may say, stop, or no. So, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. And it's interesting when I do this in workshops, everybody gets it. And, yeah. and so having a person that gets that the communication is not clear. So I work with them then on first bringing awareness to that. Like, oh, are you aware that when you put your hands out like this, your body went back? And, oh, no, I didn't know that. And so then I encourage them, okay, so put your hands out and bring your body forward also. And then add, add conviction with your voice, like you mean it. And take some practice. And oftentimes when we do an exercise like that, this is the other great thing about it. It brings up a memory of, oh, wow, my father got angry all the time. And it was terrifying to me when he got angry. And so I learned not to express my voice strongly. And so it's scary to, to express my voice with conviction. Right. And therefore, my husband uh, uses derogatory words to me and gets angry at me. And I'm not able to stand up to him. And I get anxious when he's me after he's been mean to me. Said, oh, well, no wonder I wouldn't like somebody, my, especially my husband, treating me like that either. That would feel feel really bad to me too. So we work on that. And sometimes some emotion comes up in that process, some sadness, some tears, maybe some fear about the, the past history, what happened. So we stay with that, process that, let that move through, and then come back. And I work with the person on practicing being ha expressing that with conviction, like I mean it. Stop. And yeah. Adding their body language in with it. If two thoughts came to mind uh, as, as you're talking about this. One is the value of, of workshops, where the person is really having difficulty seeing what you're talking about, you know, but everybody else in the group, because the focus isn't on them, their defenses don't have to be up. They see it clearly. And so they can really help, help the person understand, wait a second, you know, you need to open up to this because we're all seeing this. Right. Right. Yes. Yes. And, and well, ideally they can give support, additional support. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. And then the other thing is uh, it kind of opened up a whole new kettle of fish uh, in talking about what happens in marriages. And so do you ever work with the two partners in a marriage? You do? Sometimes. Sometimes, yes. yeah. Yes, yeah. I'm, I don't do couples work primarily, but uh, once in a while it's useful, especially uh, to have my 
my client bring in their spouse. And there were a couple of times when I was working online during the pandemic when the spouse or the partner was right there and I would ask, would you be willing for them to come in and help you or be a, be a participant here? And are they willing? And we did some really, some good work that way. So you were able to do work during the pandemic, uh, uh, virtual work uh, using Zoom? Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, I don't, I don't love it, but it, it worked. I was glad to be able <laughs> to keep worked. working. Okay. Yes. Yeah, yeah, wonderful. Um, but can I come back to the other part about boundaries? Because this yes. part I think is different from pretty much anything else I've seen out there is the other side of boundaries limits is just one part of boundaries and the other side of personal boundaries is reaching out for what we need or want mm -hmm. and for a lot of people that is even more scary than making and harder than setting limits and more i mean not more important but just as important to learn to reach out, to ask, and maybe even for men, it's it's harder in general also to say, to be vulnerable and say, I need a hug or I need some attention or could you just listen to me? Yeah. And so getting that and when a, a child, it's from their history, it hasn't been safe, wasn't safe to reach out as an infant for to say, with vulnerability to their world, my clients would be like, you want me to do what? <laughs> but getting that going again is very important. And it makes me think about that, that what your guest said a couple of weeks ago about the changes that need to happen in our world. And I think that it's not just a different way of thinking, it's a different way of being. And it's a way of being in relationship with one and with ourselves first, with our bodies, mm -hmm. and also with one another of being able both to set limits clearly when it's appropriate and also to reach out with vulnerability. And that is really different and really important for having healthy, positive connections with one another and in this in this world for all of us because we are all here together we all have deep needs and deep wishes yes. and need connectedness so, well i'm feeling that connection with you right now <laughs> and uh and this is probably a good place for us to close but uh Lori, you're, I want to thank you so much for being my guest today on Shrink Wrap Radio. And give your website once more. Wonderful. My website is www.laurieure.com. -E -E Wonderful. And thank you so much for having me. It's really a pleasure to talk with you. Yeah, for me too.